everyone to stand if you will. Uh, get a red book, turn to 239, or excuse me, 238. And uh, this is a beautiful song. It has a, a very uh, solemn message in it, a very beautiful message. And uh, used to have a pastor years past, many years ago, who's no longer alive. Uh, this The only song I ever heard him sing was this one right here. And about once every six or eight months, he'd, he'd sang this song. It's a beautiful song. has a great message in it. Let's real close to words of it as we're singing <laughs> sands have been washed in the footprints of the stranger on Galilee's shore, and the voice that subdued the rough billows will be heard in Judea no more, but the path of that Lord Galilee strength it shall be as my day and the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way and the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way Satan can never claim such. By and by I shall see him and praise him in that city of an ending day. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. When the last feeble step has been taken and the gates of that city appear and the beautiful songs of the angels float out on my listening ear when all that now seems so mysterious will be bright and as clear as the day then the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way then the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. Hey, y'all, we see it. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. 
I'm telling this message tonight, time for kickoff. Time for, t for kickoff. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We'll begin by reading just verse 1. If you would, please stand in honor of God's Word to read as we read this together. Philippians chapter 4, and verse 1. As Paul writes, he says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Let's go in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for your Word. The verse we've just read and also the verses we're going to read as we continue uh, through the message tonight. And I pray that you would speak to each, each one of us, that you would challenge each one of us, God. As that's our desire every time we come in, God. We don't ever want to stagnate or become static in our walk with you. But, God, we want to be, to be prodded, to be um, provoked, God, to, to love and to good works, to grow. And, Father, I, I pray that for myself and I pray that for everyone who's gathered here tonight. I pray your blessing upon this message, upon our groups, our discussion groups as we get together after the message. And that, God, it would be a challenge challenge to us as we, God, have been going through this letter and just reading these tremendous things, these tremendous uh, truths and claims and the revelation that's given. And God, I pray that we could apply these things very practically to our lives. God, we recognize, Lord, as, as James wrote, that to be a hearer of the Word is really useless, but we are to be doers of the Word. And so, God, I pray that we would see that tonight through these verses we're going to be looking at through this message tonight. And we, uh, we pray your blessing, God upon this time that your Holy Spirit would meet with us, God, speak to us, and God, that you would, God, just continue to be working in our heart, our minds, every single day, every single second of every day, just continually growing more and more like Christ. But we pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. As you think about this letter of the Philippians and how we've been going through this letter systematically, verse by verse... Just, to, just to, This has been several weeks ago, especially as we've had to cancel a few times or, or we uh, didn't have service on Sunday night. But just to remind you, as you're putting all these pieces together, the centerpiece of the letter to the Philippians is a poem. Now, we talked about poetry this morning that just because it's a poem doesn't mean it can be discarded. It can be uh, misinterpreted or it's open to interpretation that it is it is very objective in the claims that it's making. But it's a poem. It's a song that is the centerpiece of the letter to the Philippians, probably very well known and memorized by the early church. We find it in Philippians chapter two, verses five through eleven. This is the centerpiece of the letter. Listen to what this says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I believe that the poem begins right here. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This is talking about his pre-existent state. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't something to be held on to. His, in his deity, his, his godhood, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. That's talking about the incarnation. That's, that's Christmas. That's when Christ came into this world. Pre-existent, infinitely existent, but he comes into human history. When he stepped into human history, making himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Who being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. So in this humiliation, this humbling, he humbled himself in taking on a human nature becoming a human being, but he goes even beyond that, and became obedient unto death, even, even a further descent, even the death of the cross, as low as you can go, stripped, naked, and executed, beaten and tortured and executed, as low as you can possibly go. He was as high as you could possibly be, and he condescends as low as you can possibly go. Verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given he's been highly humiliated, now he's been highly exalted. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven of th and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the centerpiece of this letter. This is an enormous statement about the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. I'll put it this way, it is either, this is either true or it's blasphemy, period. Nothing in between. That Christ is God. Jesus of Nazareth is God. In fact, as Paul 
and the early church are confessing this, and I would mention this. There are claims out there today that says that, well, you know, um, Jesus never claimed to be God. That's false, first of all. Jesus never claimed to be God. But then they would also say, skeptics today would also say, and not only that, but the early church did not believe that Jesus was God. That was a later invention. That came centuries later. That came in the 200s, the 300s, and was read back in to this life of Jesus Christ. The, the theological term for that is baloney. That is not at all the case. This is an early poem that is just shouting that Jesus is God. And in fact, Paul, as he's quoting this, I don't know if Paul you know, invented this poem, but it was something that could be easily memorized, that you could remember these attributes of Christ, who Christ is, his identity, his nature, which is what we have to understand in order to be saved. This is something, I mean, keep in mind as well, no one had Bibles back then. Do you know that Jesus never had a Bible? There's no way he had a Bible. There's no way he had a copy of the Scriptures. No one did. Now, there was probably a copy in it, there in Nazareth. There was probably one copy of the Scriptures, or maybe just a portion of the Scriptures at the synagogue in Nazareth, but he had no copy of the Bible. And so they would commit these things to memory. When Jesus is quoting Scripture, he's had to sit in the synagogue as a, as a, a kid, as a young man, and hear the Scriptures and commit them to memory. And he quotes a lot of Scripture. He's committed a lot to memory. But this poem is a, is a, way, an, a way to memorize um, these attributes of Christ, the identity of Christ and who Christ is, that the early church used this. But within this poem, there is a reference to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22 through 23, about God. Listen to what this says. Look unto me and be ye saved. This is written 600 years before Christ. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me, I am God, that unto me, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what's being attributed to Jesus. This man, Jesus of Nazareth, they are attributing Isaiah 45, 23, which Paul probably had memorized. They are attributing this, which is talking about God. They're attributing it to Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, unto me, God, Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. The early church definitely believed that Jesus was God. And we see evidence of that here. This is an enormous statement. But it is also enormously practical. Because to make this huge claim, it makes this huge claim, and then it points it directly at you. Because how did Paul preface it? Let this mind be in you. Maddie, let this mind be in you. Tig, let this mind be in you. Bill, let this mind be in you. Jordan, let this mind be in you. And then it just unloads this enormous Christological, theological statement about Christ and says, you be just like that. You have that same mindset where Christ humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself. Jordan, humble yourself and humble yourself and humble yourself. If he can do it, the pre-existent infinite God, if he's willing, the Son of God, if he's willing to humble himself, surely you can humble yourself. Have this mind of Christ. Christ who, God has, who the Father has highly exalted. This is so challenging to us. It, it points the finger at us and says, You have the mind of Christ, who is God. It is clear throughout this letter as it unfolds. This is how it all ties together into that centerpiece. It is clear throughout this letter as it unfolds that the Apostle Paul has the mind of Christ. He, Paul's no hypocrite. When he's telling them, as he's writing to the inspiration of the Spirit and, and telling the Philippians to have the mind of Christ, telling all Christians to have the mind of Christ, Paul has the mind of Christ. Rejoicing in imprisonment and persecution for the gospel, sitting there at Rome as he's writing this letter. Rejoicing in imprisonment and persecution for the gospel, for the joy that is set before him, just as Christ suffered for the, for the joy that was set before him. Not trusting or clinging to dead works as a Pharisee. Remember Paul, two weeks ago we talked about how Paul was a Pharisee. He let go of those things. He did not grasp or hold on to those things. He let them go and said, forget it. It's garbage. And then he clings to God just as, as Christ is, throughout his life is clinging to the Father at all times. 
Paul is clinging to God. He's clinging to Christ. And he's pushing and straining towards the mark of the high call of God. I can't remember which gospel it were describes, but it talks about Christ. That as he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified, he's going to accomplish his mission for which he came into this world. It says he set his face as a flint. He was determined, I'm going to that cross. Nothing will stop me. Paul says, I'm pushing, I'm straining towards the mark of the high call of God. Paul had the mind of Christ. It's possible for you and for me to have the mind of Christ. And not only Paul, but also Timothy and Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is the one delivering this letter. He has been sent to Paul. He almost died on the way there, but he's not going to give up. He's going to get to Paul. He brings this gift from the Philippians. Paul now gives him this letter, sends him back to the Philippians to, to update them on what's going on. Epaphroditus and Timothy, along with Paul, have the mind of Christ. It is possible for us to have the mind of Christ. And now we come to Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy. Again, Paul, for the joy that is set before him. He, he's enduring these things. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. He's just said that, that he's going after it with everything he's got. Now he's saying, therefore, you guys also go after it. So stand fast in the Lord. He's challenging them to be steadfast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with, my, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are written, or whose names are in the book of life. So what Paul is saying is, we see the perfect example of how to do it in Jesus Christ. To have this mind of Christ, we see that perfect example in Christ. We also have the example of Paul. We have the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Philippians, it's your turn. Now it's your turn. All this sounds so good. These first three chapters, they're cheering, thinking, yes, Paul, that's it. You know, you're, you're serving Christ no matter what. That's, that's wonderful. Yes, Christ was faithful. He, he suffered that humiliation. He's now been highly exalted. All this sounds so good. But then Paul turns around and says, now it's your turn. It's your turn to humble yourself. And then you hear a collective gulp. Because it all sounds so good in theory. But now it's their turn. Now Paul gets personal. Now he gets into their business. Now he starts meddling. I like what one preacher said that, you know, a preacher's getting up preaching, he's getting a bunch of amens, and, but then he stopped preaching and went to meddling because then he talked about specific things. We don't want any meddling. Paul's saying, this, imagine me saying this, saying this from the pulpit. June, Pat, here you guys are in a disagreement. It gets squashed in this message today. You're going to work this thing out. Could you imagine that? That's exactly what Paul just did. The poor old uh, Euodius and Syntyche. This letter is being read to the entire congregation. And all of a sudden you hear your name. And I hear you guys are, I hear there's been an argument. I hear you guys are arguing. It ends today. Because you're going to change your mind. Because of what I said in chapter 2. That would be, it's like, you know, Paul's getting very personal and very practical here. You're going to come together. The argument's over. It's time to squash it. You're going to come together in the same mind. And it's not your mind, and it's not your mind. It's the mind of Christ. Remember that guy from chapter 2? I meant that. Your turn. Your turn to humble yourselves. Who's going to be the, there should be a race. Who's going to be the first one to say, I was wrong. Forgive me. I, should not, I shouldn't have, have argued with you. Forgive me. Who, it's a race to say, who's going to be the first one to have the mind of Christ? I can just imagine getting called out in this letter as it's being read publicly. It's tense. I mean, that, that would... Every, the whole room, I promise you, when that got read, it got tense in that room because this, is a, this has been reported back to Paul all the way over in Rome by Epaphroditus. When Paul addresses this, that room got tense. And so it's tense, but it's also honoring because they're Paul's co-laborers in the gospel. You notice what he says. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. You're going to notice that phrase over and over again, in the Lord. 
And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, this is a different individual, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. They're Paul's co-laborers. These may even be some of the women along, was it Lydia, I think, that, that was there at Philippi at the, at the beginning of the church. He may be, these may be women that were there at the very beginning. These are charter members of the church at Philippi. These are Paul's co-laborers in the gospel, so it's tense, but it's also honoring of these women. Women. Did you not know that Paul was a feminist? He was a feminist. Again, you've been, you hear all these false reports today that he's a chauvinist, that he's, um, that he's some kind of male chauvinist. No, he was a feminist in the first century. He was definitely a feminist. They would have read that and saying co-laborers, women as co-laborers, let me, let me ask it this way. I wonder how many women were co-laborers with Paul in his Jewish Pharisaism. How many women labored with him? I don't wonder. I know. Zero. The Pharisees, if I'm not mistaken, used to pray and thank God that they were not created as women. Is that correct? I think I've heard, They said, oh God, thank you that I'm not a woman. They weren't co-laborers. Paul says, these ladies are my co-laborers in the gospel. You might want to note that next time someone comes to you and says, well, the Bible is primitive, it's sexist. Oh, really? That doesn't sound sexist to me. Men and women, Christ has called us as men and women to labor together in Christ in the church. Yet still being men and women, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, we keep our identity, our uniqueness, our distinctives, but we are co-laborers together in Christ and in the church. That's exactly the way Christ intended it. We're all co-laborers together here, men and women. So Paul is saying it's the Philippians' turn now to have the mind of Christ. And he's getting very personal. He's saying now it's their turn to get their heads right. That I, and, and to acknowledge it's not about them, it's about Christ and unity in Christ, unity in the Lord. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You see this in the Lord. Stand fast, verse 1, stand fast in the Lord. Uh, Euodius and Syntyche have the same mind, what? In the Lord. Rejoice, verse 4, in the Lord always. It keeps appealing back to this guy from chapter 2. Notice this phrase, in the Lord. Remember that poem. Remember that guy from chapter 2. In the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. This is a persecuted church. Paul is a persecuted Christian writing to a persecuted church. He's saying, don't rejoice in your circumstances. As persecution and as adversity. There's already been bloodshed in Philippi. Paul was beaten. Remember the Philippian jailer? Paul and Silas, they were beaten. There's already been bloodshed. There's, a, there's bloodshed a decade ago there in Philippi. Don't rejoice in your circumstances as persecution and adversity comes. Rejoice in the Lord. In Christ, that guy from chapter 2, it from the poem, in Christ and His triumphant finished work, that's what you rejoice in. Forget your circumstances. Forget the adversity. Forget the persecution. Rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Moderation, that's your gentleness. That's your, your reasonableness. To kind of just paraphrase that, what he's saying is this. Everyone that knows you should know you're a Christian. It should, it should never be a surprise to anybody. They should know. If they know you, they know you're a Christian. Because that's who you are. That's your identity. Let your moderation, let your reasonableness, let your reputation as a Christian be known to all men. Everyone should know that you're a Christian. The Lord is at hand. Now I think that the Lord is at hand. There's two different things Paul could be saying there. He may be saying them both. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Your gentleness, that, that's your demeanor, that's the, your way of life. I mean, a Christian, should be, you should be able to spot a Christian out of nowhere. It, Jen and I used to go to two, um, foster parenting classes. It's amazing. You sit down there and say, that's a Christian. I walked into a hospital room. Um, when was that? Uh, Friday, walked in the room, began talking with Janice's mom. That's a Christian. She's ready. 
terminal cancer. I walked in that room within probably 60 seconds. I walked in that room and said, she's ready. If they want me to preach her a funeral, I'm more than happy to do so. She's ready. 86 years old, she's ready to be with the Lord. She's going to trust God for whatever comes. She's ready. Her spirit immediately bore with it. It was my spirit. Her moderation was known to me as soon as I walked in the room. She's ready. That's the way we should be. Everyone should know you're... You should never be a covert Christian. Everyone should know you're a Christian. Everybody should know that you're a Christian. You know, that's why it's such a problem in countries where there's such intense persecution. Because it's going to get out. When you, when you become a believer and you're living in a Muslim country, your moderation is known to all men. You can't hold it in. They're going to find out. As a Christian, everyone should know that you're a Christian. And that doesn't mean you're running around blabbing it, saying, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a, you know, wearing a, wearing a T-shirt. That's not what I'm talking about. Not, not everyone know your, your T-shirts be known to all men or your bumper sticker be known to all men. Let your moderation be known to all men. They should know by your character. Christian t-shirts are fine. I wore one yesterday. That Tig gave me. My old buddy Tig made me. So, well, and by that I mean Shannon made me. Tig requested it, which took no effort whatsoever. So thank you, Shannon, for that t-shirt. I thank God for Christian t-shirts, but that should not be how people know we're a Christian, by what t-shirt we wear. They should know our moderation, our gentleness, our reasonableness. They should know by our personality that we're a Christian. The Lord is at hand. It can mean two different things. Number one, He is watching. He's present. I love, you can say, where's Jesus at? Where's he at right now? Well, he's at the right hand of the Father, and that's true. But then I go to Revelation, and I find him amongst the candlesticks. What are the candlesticks? That's the church. He is, in the, he is perpetually in the presence of the church. We're in his presence right now. He's in the midst of the candlesticks still to this day. The Lord is at hand. He's present. When you go to work, when you go to school, He's there. He's, he's sitting there waiting on you. When you show up, He's there. That's why you should be the same person there that you are here. Because the Lord is at hand. He's here and He's there. But not only that, the Lord is at hand. That also means, you know, that, that phrase, I like the way um, Dallas Willard talks about it. If you, you know, and if you walk down this hallway, um, you know, as you walk out the church, as you walk down that hallway, there on your left, the bathrooms are at hand because they're right there. That means they're, 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 you're, going to be, you're going to be walking right upon them as you walk out that door. What that saying is, is that it is at hand. Christ preached and said the kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's right there. Well, it's saying the Lord is at hand. That means that He's present. He's, he's always present there with us, there with the church. But also, I think He's referring to His return, His return which is imminent. It's at hand at any second. Christ can return. And I think Paul writes about that to the Thessalonians. The return of Christ is at hand and has been at hand for the last 2,000 years. It means it can happen at any second. It is perpetually, constantly at hand. I may not finish this message. He may show up. And if He shows up, this message is done. And if you're a Christian, you'll be with Him. And if you're not, you'll be left. His return is at hand. It is imminent. I think Paul is actually probably appealing to both things. He's present, He's there, and He can return in any second. Therefore, let your moderation be known unto all men. Verse 6, Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, that's, that's asking for stuff. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. What it's saying is, do not be anxious, be prayerful. Don't be a warrior, be a warrior in prayer. I think probably if we really took that to heart, the whole, this altar could fill up with everybody praying and repenting. I'm a worrier. I don't want to be a worrier. It's the last thing I want to be. I'm a worrier. Are you? Stop it. That's what he's saying. Stop. Stop being a worrier and start being a prayer. Do not be anxious, but be prayerful. Do not be a worrier, but be a warrior in prayer. If you have problems, you have prayers. Do you have problems? Good, you have prayers. Get to praying. Stop worrying and pray. That's exactly what Paul's saying. This is very practical. 
He's, he's getting to the very nitty-gritty, rubber-meets-the-road, practical application of everything he said, especially that poem in chapter 2. Verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Our joy is in the Lord. Our peace is in our God. That's the best place it can be. It is permanent. It is persevering. And He will guard us. I don't know what's going to happen this week. I was shocked Friday when I heard my friend in Greenville was killed in a tractor accident. I was shocked. I promise you, and there's no way you can really think this way, but we need to be mindful that we can live this world at any time. I'll promise you the plan for tomorrow was not a funeral for him. It was a shock to his wife, I'll promise you. We don't know what this week holds, but as a Christian, I can say this with confidence, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's this week for me. Maybe it's a car wreck. Maybe it's an aneurysm. Who knows? Maybe I go, maybe I go to heaven this week. Maybe next Sunday night, I'm in heaven. I'm not here. Again, that's, that's the whole appeal. I've, I've been saying, we need to be ready as a church. What if that happens? What's the plan? What's the next step? Because it really can't happen. That's how I could be in the ground. This body could be in the ground next Sunday. That's how quickly it can happen. But I can say as a Christian, my, our peace is in God. And let the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, it shall, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It, 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 may, it stabilizes everything. It establishes us. It grounds us. It has grounded Paul, it will ground the Philippians, and it will ground you, and it will ground me. Verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the gift of God, and the grace of God, excuse me, and the grace and the God of peace shall be with you. And the God of peace shall be with you. What Paul is saying, it was true for him, it was true for the Philippians, and it's true tonight for every one of us. It is so easy to focus on the negative. I've made the comment before, I could walk out of this church after preaching on Sunday morning. I could have 25 people say, Jordan, man, thank you for that message. It was such a blessing. Thank you for that. One person can say, I disagree with everything you said. Guess what I'm going to remember? A 25 to 1 ratio. Forget the 25. They didn't say anything. All I'm going to remember is that one. It is so easy to focus on the negative. It's as easy as falling off a log. It requires no training, no instruction. It just happens. Paul says, just like with being anxious, being full of care and being anxious, Paul says, stop it. No. Don't fall into that trap of just dwelling on the negative. He's saying, stop it. Focus on what is good. Focus on what is good. That's exactly what he's saying in verse 8. And he goes on and says, those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, everything he's been saying in this letter, as, we, as we're getting a, a lot of biographical things about Paul in the letter of the Philippians, do. Your turn. Paul's saying, I, I'm doing these things. We see what Christ has done perfectly, the perfect example. You see what I am doing. You see what Timothy is doing. You see what Epaphroditus is doing. Do it. Your turn. And the peace of God shall be with you, just as it has been with me. Just as He has been with me, He will be with you. That's what Paul's message is. Now, I've entitled this message tonight, Time for Kickoff. You know, every, as we close tonight, every team, the week leading up to a game, you think about football, and I know the women here especially love all these sports analogies, but it's the way my brain works. So time for kickoff. Every team the week leading up to a game has a plan for victory. 
Every time. Do you, at no team has ever in the history of football gone into a game planning to lose. They have a plan for victory. They've watched film of their opponents. They've studied their opponents. They've got a playbook. They've got a game plan specific to that opponent. They've prepared all week, but now it's kickoff time. And people are vomiting. I've seen it with my own eyes. We've been playing it all. Why is Billy Lincoln felt throwing up in the trash can again? Before every game, without exception, however many games he played in, he threw up in the trash can before every game. That's our quarterback. You're, I'm watching that thinking, you know, we've prepared for this. Why are you throwing up again? Hopefully he can listen to this message sometime. Before every game, he threw up in the trash can because it's kickoff time now. It sounded so We drew it up on the board. We got it. That one scores a touchdown. It sounds so good in theory. It all works. And by the way, it's the same thing right here. Sunday morning, Sunday night. Man, we've got the perfect play. We're ready for the week ahead. We've gone over the playbook. We're ready. This is going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. Nothing but just success and victory all week long. It's the same thing we experience here. Every, every play results in a touchdown. You know, you draw it up on the board and say, well, you know, you're going to kick out the defensive end and you're going to run here and you're going to score a touchdown. And then this other play, you're going to run a slant and you're going to run a post and you're going to throw it to this deep route. And if, but if he's covered, you throw it to him and he's going to score a touchdown or you're going to run the post and he's going to score a touchdown. Every play results in a touchdown on the whiteboard. You never say you're going to run and you're going to spin out here and get sacked for a 10 yard loss. That is never, that is never, ever, I've never seen that in my entire life on any playbook. Every one of them ends in the end zone. Every single play ends in the end zone. Every play results in a touchdown, dot, 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 in theory. You've planned, but now you have to execute it. Christ made it look so easy. We've seen the film. We see what he did. He made it look so easy. It's like watching in high school football, if you were watching your opponent play and Maryville beat them 50 to nothing last week. Oh, we know exactly what to do. Do what Maryville did. But it doesn't always work out that way. Maryville goes undefeated five years in a row. We lose 50% of the time. We saw what Christ did. We've seen, we've watched the footage to say, that's how you beat the devil. We have the playbook. We know exactly what to do. Christ made it look easy. Paul has made it look easy. He, he shows us how to beat the devil. He shows us how to beat the flesh. Paul made it look easy. But now it's our turn. Tom Brady makes it look easy. He just keeps... He makes it, it looks like it's hard to lose the Super Bowl. It's hard not to go to the Super Bowl. He makes it look easy. But now it's our turn. Now it's time for kickoff. Now it's 20 seconds. Now you're lined up on the kickoff team, and the football's on the tee, and you're getting ready to run, and you know this is going to result in probably a safety the way we drew it up, but there's that opponent, and he didn't look that big on the film because he was, he was out there on the screen, but now he's over there, and he's here instead of there, and, and now all of a sudden everything is different, and everybody's nervous, and now we find out that it's hard. Now it's kickoff time. Now it's your turn. Now it's my turn. Everything that Paul has said, we know what to do, but now it's our turn. To quote that wise philosopher, I figure I uh, sung a Bob Dylan song this morning, so I figure I'll quote this wise philosopher, Mike Tyson, just to make sure that, everything, that this Sunday is completely ruined. Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Every person who ever boxed against Mike Tyson, they had the plan. This is how I'm going to knock that dude out. I'm ready. And they all had a plan until they punched him in the mouth. And the plan, probably with the mouthpiece, which it, the plan's gone, the mouthpiece is gone. They had a plan. It's the same thing. We have a plan here tonight. But now we got to go fight the fight. Now the bell rings. I'm mixing all these metaphors of football and boxing. Now the bell rings. Now we have to go fight. That's a different story. 
So we're going to discuss this as a group. But that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, now, here's your boxing gloves. You get up there in the ring, ring the bell. Now it's your turn. That's what Paul is saying as he's closing this letter. We're going to stop with that tonight.